Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Today we shall be talking about neonatal resuscitation. This may be a really bulky lecture, so please grab your notepad, grab your paper, and let's go. It is very important that you know this, especially as a final year student. If you're in fifth year and you're in the NICU for the first time, this is a very important aspect for you to start so that you could gain the knowledge of how to actually resuscitate newborn babies, even babies that are pretty much admitted to the NICU. So there were some major changes that we made to the resuscitation protocol or uh, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation protocol. Uh, one of the major changes that was made is that we now institute what is known as delayed cord clamping, especially in individuals that are not compromised. So in individuals that are not at risk or high risk babies. So we want to delay the cord clamping by at least about a minute. And when we do this, this is actually meant to improve the iron status in actually the term infants. In addition to this, you may also actually milk, milk the cord about four times prior to clamping in the infants that are going to be requiring major resuscitation. In preterm infants, we've actually noticed that they actually require less ionotropic support and fewer blood transfusions as compared to the other age groups of the neonates. And another interesting fact that we have noted from research and data analysis is that uh, infants that are born from a cesarean section under regional anesthesia, those between the weeks of 37 to 39 weeks uh, without any uh, antenatal identifiable risk, versus those that are born uh, at a similar age uh, via vaginal delivery um, performed at term. Um, this actually doesn't have any significant increase in the risk of the baby requiring any endotracheal intubation. Then the other major change that was made to this resuscitation procedure or protocol is that Generally, the commencement of resuscitation should start using room air. And if you have a blender, please use blender. So mix room air plus 100% oxygen. And there actually isn't any significant results that have shown that 100% oxygen actually confers a better advantage over room air. That's why I insist that you start on room air or then proceed to blending uh, both room air and 100% oxygen. And of course, there is a reduced mortality that we have noted in infants that are resuscitated on room air. And in addition to this, if the infant is actually going to be requiring any chest compressions, so please make sure that you increase the inspired oxygen to 100%. Again, no information has been, no information has been noted on the different um, concentrations of oxygen that may actually be needed for optimum results because no research has been done yet. We may also want to do a, use a pulse oximeter, which we can attach to the right hand uh, or the wrist. And usually there are now better pulse oximeters that have now been uh, created specifically for the use in the NICU because um, the conventional pulse oximeters generally don't work if the tissues of the child are generally underperfused. So we could use this as a guide to how much oxygen we're going to be uh, giving or the percentage of the oxygen that we're going to be given. And, uh, and with infants that are born before 32 weeks, you should actually place them in a food grade plastic wrap or a bag without actually even drying them. Uh, just after they are, they are born. Then routine aspiration of any infant that uh, is born and you suspect that there is meconium that has been passed during the process, we do not routinely um, aspirate for that as we used to do. Then, of course, that adrenaline that was uh, initially given via endotracheal tube, the initial dose, we don't do that anymore. We usually like to give this via an intravenous route. And of course, when you intubate and you want to confirm that your tube is in place, please use a, a, capno, a capnometry. So a capnograph could be used, which just simply measures the amount of expired carbon dioxide. But of course, if you do not have this in the setting, I shall mention some other things that may point you towards um, you being able to make a diagnosis that this tube is actually within the trachea. Then of course, in some Infants that have moderate to severe high HIE, which is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, either at term or near term, you can perform therapeutic hypothermia, so cooling them 
to a certain extent. There are also some protocols that we shall discuss when we look at hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So some key notes before we actually go into the actual steps that you have to undertake whenever you're dealing with resuscitation of the neonate. Remember that this is this resuscitation is going to be applying to newly born infants that are undergoing pretty much this transition from the intrauterine area to uh, living outside the uterus. But you could also use these same principles in, res in resuscitation of the neonates that have already transitioned past this perinatal point. So it means that those infants that are admitted in the NICU for the first few weeks, if they require resuscitation, you could use these same uh, points that would, still val that would still be valid. These same steps are the ones that we shall carry out. And then, of course, uh, in the uh, term newly born infant, the, the term that we're going to use is newly born infant. And this term is going to be used to denote that we're talking about an infant that is present at the time of birth. And then if we use the term newborn or neonate, we're going to be using this to refer to an infant that is um, present during the initial hospitalization. Now, remember that about 10% of these newborn babies actually require some assistance to actually begin breathing at birth and less than 1% require extensive resuscitation measures. So what you really need to note is that when a child is born, there's something that's known as an APCO score, which is scored out of 10. The higher the score, the better it is or the, the better um, or the less the need for resuscitation to this uh, newborn baby. But of course, that's not really an indication of how effective your resuscitation measures are. It just points you towards the need for resuscitation there and then. If you do not know what the APCA score is, please check it up. We shall release a video very soon on the APCA score. I really want to take my time on this because it's a very important aspect, especially for the final year student. And remember that at delivery, there should be at least one person whose primary, primary responsibility is pretty much the newly born baby. So this individual must actually have the skills to perform this resuscitation. They must have the skills to be able to perform endotracheal intubation. And of course, they must have the skills to administer medication. But take note that this is a teamwork thing. You may not be able to do it on your own necessarily. But if you're found in such a situation where you're on your own, you should be able to at least know what to do. So whenever you're dealing with a newly born infant, you should always ask yourself three things. Number one thing that you should ask yourself is, is this a term pregnancy? And remember that term is 37, every, every infant that's born at 37 weeks and beyond. So you refer to that as term and anyone beyond 37 weeks is term. So are they term or are they preterm? If they are preterm, how preterm are they? Is it early preterm, uh, extreme preterm where they are even closer to even 28 weeks? Or um, this is closer to 37 weeks, perhaps they are at 36 weeks. The second question that you should ask yourself is, is this baby crying or breathing? Okay. And is it spontaneous? The third question that you should ask yourself is that, is there any good muscle tone in this newly born infant? Now, if you answer all those three questions and the answer to these three questions is yes, you get an infant that's a term that's crying and breathing very well and that has good muscle tone, then you do not actually need to resuscitate this child. This child shouldn't be separated from the mother. All you could do is simply dry up the child, uh, place uh, the child skin to skin with the mother, and of course cover the child with some dry linen to actually maintain the temperature. You, could, you can continue observing the breathing as activity as well as the color of the infant. Now, if any one of those questions is no. So if the child is not a term, if the child is not breathing or not crying, if the child doesn't have good tone, then you should go ahead and perform one of the following steps, which we shall talk about systematically. So there are some initial steps that are going to be involving stabilization. So you want to provide warmth, you want to clear the airway, you want to uh, pretty much dry this child and stimulate this child. You want to perform some ventilation, you want to perform some chest compressions, and you want to administer epinephrine or other volume expanders uh, such as um, crystalloids. Now, in this process of resuscitation, remember that time is really life. So the longer that you take doing this, the worse are the outcome. So you want to ensure that you're doing it at an optimal uh, pace and you are analyzing everything 
optimally. So 60 minutes is what is known as the golden minute. So this is the time that's going to be allocated for you to complete the initial steps for you to reevaluate and actually to begin the ventilation. You only have 60 seconds and you should be checking and assessing this child every 30 seconds. As we shall see at the end of this lecture in the algorithm, I shall show you an algorithm where you should be actually reassessing this child every single 30 seconds. Now, the things that you want to look out for when you are resuscitating, the two parameters that you're going to monitor are obviously your respirations. So you want to look out for apnea. You want to look out for gasping. You want to look out for labored breathing or if the breathing is unlabored. Then you also want to check your heart rate. So generally, you want your heart rate to be above 100. If it's less than 100, if it's closer to 100, it may not be an issue, but it becomes an issue, especially if the heart rate is persistently below 60. Generally, for an infant, a good infant, you want to get your heart rate at least above 100. Then you could actually do this by intermittently auscultating the uh, precordial pulse because you may not be able to um, palpate the uh, peripheral pulses. And when you actually, when a pulse is actually detected, you may actually uh, palpate the umbilical pulse. And this can actually provide you with a rough estimate of the pulse. And it's actually more accurate than the other peripheral sites that you are used to. Then if you do not want to do this, like I said, there are some oximeters that you could attach to the child's right um uh, right uh, hand and this could pretty much be uh, sensing the oxygen saturation that can help you determine the pulse. Now the, re the good thing about these pulse oximeters is that there are some that are specially designed for NICU but the conventional pulse oximeters pretty much take some time for you to apply so about one to two minutes and sometimes they may not even function when this child has a very poor cardiac output or when the uh, perfusion of the tissues are not so good so you may face some challenges and remember time is life the more time you're spending applying that minus you doing these resuscitative procedures then this child is going to have a much much poor prognosis okay so the evaluations uh, that you're going to be making once you uh, institute the positive pressure vent ventilation or the supplementary oxygen. Once you begin that, you keep monitoring the heart rate, you keep monitoring the respiration, you keep monitoring the state of oxygenation. So you do this every single 30 minutes. I mean, 30 seconds or 30 minutes, pardon me, 30 seconds. So if the heart rate increases, this is a very good indicator that whatever you're doing is working. Okay, so if the heart rate increases and it's well above 100, then you could actually um, just monitor the infant. If the respirations also improve, it's, a, it's also a good sign. And then, of course, if the oxygen saturations improve, it's also a good sign. We shall talk about these um, later on. So now if you get a child that now requires resuscitation, of course, the first thing that you should actually do is to at least um, call for help around you. If there's anyone that's around, call them to come and assist you with some help. So you may get someone who is obviously going to start looking at the watch. So start a, start a stopwatch, start a timer. The time that you put the child on the resuscitator, start that timer because time is of the essence when it comes to resuscitation. You, don't wanna, you do not want to spend anything more than 10 minutes. So if you have been resuscitating a child for 10 minutes and they do not actually um, get better, then it's most likely that they won't. And it's most likely that you should contemplate stopping because the adverse outcomes greatly outweigh or greatly outweigh the benefits. And of course, the most effective step that's going to be there that you should keep in mind is ventilation. So ventilation is very key, especially in the neonates. Even much more important than uh, the chest compressions, ventilation is very key, especially in the neonates. Okay, so if you get a good ventilation, then that could be the reason why your heart rate spikes up or begins to increase. As long as there's hypoxia, the heart rate, that, that could be one of the causes of bradycardia. And then, of course, use oxygen sparingly and, of course, blend it with air. You could have um, air, but remember, whenever you start doing the chest compressions, please administer 100% oxygen. You could even adapt the inflation time of the air that you're blowing into the, the um, child's chest uh, to actually achieve um, good chest movements, you could use a T-tube or a Neopuff device if possible. And please avoid overheating in term infants. 
after you have resuscitated them because there's post-resuscitation care that has to be taken place. So please avoid overheating the infants, especially with the term babies. Then stop resuscitating if you still have no beat after 10 minutes. Like I told you, do not continue. Please avoid using uh, fluid boluses, avoid using naloxone, avoid using bicarbonate routinely. We do not give these uh, routinely to neonates. So keep these things in mind and keep them in the back of your mind. Every time you are you're seeing a resuscitation happening or going on, you should always be watching the time. You should always see what the other doctors are doing in the NICU. So the step one. So these are the steps that you're, we're going to be following in order to resuscitate. I'll give you an algorithm at the end that will put everything together and summarize everything together so that you have a good understanding of how neonates are actually resuscitated. So our step one is, of course, to provide warmth. So you want to take the child, put them at the resuscitate. And of course, this is going to help with uh, providing the warmth. So they should be placed under radiant heat source. And of course, you should position the child in what is known as a sniffing position. I shall show you a picture in the next two slides. So the, how to do this, first of all, the step one is that you're going to be uh, performing simple head extension. So simply the shoulders should um, roll and so there shouldn't be any shoulder roll or anything that's underneath or any pillow that's underneath the child. You could put the pillow underneath, um, I could say the back, the upper back of the child. Then of course, the neck should be wide and open. The glabella as well as the chin should be horizontally aligned. I'll show you a picture just very shortly of how this looks like. Then the third thing that you should ensure, and remember this is happening quickly. This is all happening in one minute. The third thing that you should ensure is that the external auditory meatus as well as the sternal notch are in the horizontal plane. So here's what it looks like. So our step one here, of course, simple head extension. So there should be no shoulder row or a headrest. So as you can see what's happening here, the glabella as well as the chin are all in one plane like so then the second step you can see that the neck here is uh, open and it's wide then you have the external auditory meatus also at the same plane as the sternal notch here at the horizontal plane so if all these things are okay then you have achieved this sniffing position here's another picture to help you um Understand, as we can see here, we have a one here with the headrest here and a, a shoulder row over here. So the glabella and the chin are going to be horizontally aligned. The neck is going to be wide open, so wide and open. And of course, the external auditory meatus as well as the suprasternal notch are going to be in the same plane. So you refer to this as the sniffing position. Then, of course, we remember when you're doing your resuscitation in adult medicine, we use the approach of the ABCs. For almost every emergency, we use the approach of the ABCs, the A for airway, B for, B for breathing, C for circulation. So when it comes to the airway, remember that you want to clear the airway. So if necessary, use a bulb syringe, which is what is shown here, um, or you could use a suction catheter, of course, dry the baby and stimulate breathing. So if the amniotic fluids in the delivery room was, is clear or was clear, then you only need to suction this infant if there is any obvious obstruction due to any mucus or if this child requires positive pressure ventilation, then you could contemplate suctioning. Otherwise, we do not routinely suction um, the airway of this infant. Then, of course, if meconium was present, we, we way back, we used to suction uh, the oropharynx before delivery of the shoulder, but according to research, there has been no significant um, benefits of this. So we do not also routinely suction uh, the meconium. Then you also want to check for your oxygen saturations. Remember that the blood levels in an uncompromised baby generally are not going to be reaching uh, the values, the extra uterine values until this child has been outside the uterus for about 10 minutes. So which is why we usually should only go for 10 minutes. We shouldn't go beyond this because if this child is not improving beyond this, then the chances of them improving are very slim. Okay, so the saturations may actually be about 70 to 80 percent for like about several minutes. And then this child may even appear cyanosed. And some studies actually go on to show that the skin color actually is a very poor indicator of oxygen saturation. And during the, this intermediate um, or this immediate neonatal period, lack of cyanosis 
is also a very poor indicator of oxygenation, um, as well as um, this uh, individual who has this um, oxygen saturation. Those are uh, maybe poor indicators of um, oxygenation. Then the other thing that we are going to be doing is we're going to be using a pulse oximeter. So a pulse oximeter could actually be used if we anticipate that this child may require resuscitation. Suppose you are anticipating to receive a preterm uh, infant. So you may already have all these things in place. You may have a pulse oximeter already in place. So whenever you're using positive pressure uh, ventilation, please administer um, the pulse oximeter. And whenever you get a cyanosis that is persistent or when there's a supplemental oxygen that is needed, please use a pulse oximeter continuously. And remember that the initial resuscitation or the initial oxygen that we're going to be giving is room air because there hasn't been any significant benefits of patients that have been started on 100% oxygen versus patients that have been started on room air. So use room air or a blended oxygen, whichever is available. So then you have to titrate the oxygen concentration to achieve your target saturations. Okay, so if the baby is bradycardic, meaning the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, after about 90 seconds, then with a lower concentration of oxygen, then the oxygen concentration should be increased to 100% until um, you get a normal heart rate. So at one minute, your target should be roughly ab about 60 to 65 oxygen saturation. At two minutes, 65 to 70% oxygen saturation. At three minutes, 70 to 75% oxygen saturation. At four minutes, 75 to 80% oxygen saturation. At five minutes, uh, 80 to 85 percent and then at 10 minutes it should be at 85 to 95 percent oxygen saturation that's where you should actually aim for and if this infant is actually remaining apneic despite you giving adequate oxygen and if your heart rate still is less than 100 despite you giving oxygen then you can start positive pressure ventilation then when it comes to B, remember your ABC is airway, breathing, circulation. When it comes to B, which is breathing and ventilation, you want to initiate inflations uh, uh, following birth, which can either be spontaneous or assisted. Uh, so these spontaneous breaths or assisted breaths actually help in creating this functional residual capacity inside the child's lung. So the optimal pressure or the optimal inflation time, even the flow rate at which we shall, we should where we should inflate these lungs to establish a good or even an effective FRC or a functional residual capacity um, when we're using a positive pressure ventilation, it's not really determined from research. So generally, assistant ventilation rates should be between 40 to 60 uh, uh, breaths per minute. That's what's common in many hospitals. And the primary measure of adequate initial ventilation is prompt improval of the heart rate. So the heart rate is going to be a very good indicator that you have really ventilating this child. If this child isn't, vent isn't ventilating, you should check certain things, which I shall show you on your algorithm. Then of course, just that, check that this the chest movements of this child uh, are happening. And um, if the chest is moving, then you should consider other things. And then many experts actually uh, recommend that you administer continuous positive airway pressure to infants who are breathing, even those that have uh, are breathing spontaneously, but uh, with difficulty following birth. Although there hasn't been studies that um, have been done in term infants, the only studies that have been done are in preterm infants. Then, of course, you may also want to do a laryngeal mask uh, airway or use a laryngeal, laryngeal mask airway that may actually fit over the laryngeal inlet. And this has been shown to have um, an effect for ventilating newborns weighing at least more than a 2 kg or those that are de delivered greater than 34 weeks gestation. And of course, a laryngeal mask airway uh, should be considered during resuscitation if the face mask isn't providing ventilation successfully or if you can't intubate. So it's, it's kind of like the third option. The first thing that you want to do is first use a face mask, a well-fitting, tight, tightly sealed face mask. If that isn't really working, then you can contemplate intubating this child. If that fails, then your last resort, of course, will be your laryngeal face mask. And the person that's doing this must have adequate skill in being able to do this. So with the endotracheal intubation placement, you really want to initiate, um, you, you, this is indicated when you want to initiate endotracheal suction of non-vigorous meconium stained 
uh, uh, newborns. You also want to do this if a bag mask ventilation is an effective way of using your Ambu bag and face mask. And of course, when you are performing chest compressions, you should also start contemplating placing an endotracheal tube um, for special resuscitation circumstances such as a congenital diaphragmatic hernia as well as extremely low birth weight, you want to contemplate inserting an endotracheal tube. And remember that after you insert this endotracheal tube and you start administering intermittent positive pressure ventilation, there is going to be a prompt rise in the heart rate. And this is a good indicator that the, the tracheal tube is actually within the tracheobronchial tree and not really in the wrong place, provided that you're giving this effective ventilation. Remember that the most accurate way to determine that the endotracheal tube is within the trachea is by measuring the exhaled carbon dioxide. That's the most accurate way, the capnometry. But you may also look at other features that tend to be less reliable. So you may see misting of the endotracheal tube. You may sometimes see that the chest begins to move. Sometimes when you auscultate the lungs, you will get this equal bilateral air entry. Then we move on to C, which is circulation and chest compressions. Remember that chest compressions are going to be indicated if the heart rate is below 60. Despite you adequately ventilating this person, you may have even intubated this person. You may be giving supplemental oxygen for 30 seconds. Remember, you're going to be assessing this every single 30 seconds. So because ventilation is actually the most effective thing that's going to be there in neonatal resuscitation, like I already told you, then chest compressions are likely to compete with this effective ventilation. That's why we usually start with the ventilation. So when um, the rescuer is actually performing this resuscitation, the assisted ventilation that's being delivered to this child should be optimal before you actually contemplate starting to give chest compressions. And remember that these chest compressions are going to be delivered in the lower a third of the sternum, about a depth of one third of the anterior posterior diameter of the chest. And there are two techniques that we could use. The two thumb encircling hand technique, which is much more superior to the two uh, finger technique. I'll show you a picture of this in the next slide. So this two thumb encircling technique, this is where you're going to be placing two thumbs over the sternum. And of course, your other fingers will be encircling the child, kind of like you're holding a door, but your thumbs are in front. And of course, the other fingers will be supporting the back. Then the two finger technique, you get two fingers with... Um, the second hand actually supporting the back. I'll show you a picture of how this looks like. And then, of course, this is recommended. The two thumb encircling hand technique is recommended in the newly born because it's going to be generating a higher peak um, systolic values. It's going to be generating higher coronary perfusion pressures. So here is a picture of the two thumb technique. As you can see, these two thumbs over the lower border of the sternum like that and the other fingers supporting the back. Here is one where the infant is actually laying flat. Then, of course, this is a two finger technique. And then how many chest compressions are you going to be doing in this neonate? Remember that compression and ventilation should be coordinated and shouldn't be simultaneous. So... The chest should actually be permitted to re-expand fully before you actually compress it again, okay? And the, the fingers or the thumbs of the rescuer should never leave the chest of the child until maybe after 10 minutes has gone on or if this child's heart rate has improved. Then we, we usually use a ratio of three to one. So we give uh, compressions, about 90 compressions to 30 breaths, where we want to achieve about 120 events per minute to actually maximize ventilation that can be achieved. And remember that each event is going to be allocated half a second with exhalation occurring during the first compression after each ventilation. So take note of this whenever you are performing the chest compressions. Then we move on to D, which I shall combine drugs such as epinephrine together with the fluids. Remember that drugs are rarely indicated when you're resuscitating a newly born infant. And if the child has bradycardia that is still persistent, this may actually indicate that there's an inadequate lung inflation. Sometimes it may indicate profound hypoxemia, like I told you. And, um, you have to ensure that you establish an adequate ventilation, which is the most important step to controlling this bradycardia. And if this child's heart rate remains less than 60, despite you actually giving adequate ventilation, despite you actually giving uh, or intubating this child and giving 100% oxygen, despite you actually performing chest compressions, then you can actually uh, contemplate administering epinephrine, administering some volume expansion uh, fluids, 
or even both. Rarely do we give buffers narcotic uh, antagonists such as naloxone. Rarely do we give vasopressors. Um, so usually these um, may be useful even after resuscitation, but we rarely give them, especially in neonates. So we want to give epinephrine. So epinephrine, the root of administration is IV. We used to give it via the endotracheal tube, the first dose at least, but we usually give it IV now. So the dosage is going to be 0.01 milligrams per kg per dose up to 0.03 milligrams per kg per dose or if you want to use mils you could use one mil per kg which is it just simply comes down to the same thing and if we use actually a much higher dose like 0.1 and we give it iv it may actually result in certain nasty side effects such as hypertension even worsening of neurological functions so that's why we want to keep it at a much lower dose and then if we're using endotracheal roots in places where they're not yet updated with the newer guidelines we use it at a dose of 0.05 to about 0.1 though the safety of this and the eff eff efficacy of this has not yet been studied and has not yet been um, proven. Then, of course, the concentration of epinephrine that we use is 1 to 10,000. So that's about 0.1 milligrams per mil. So in one mil, you get 0.01 milligrams. So let's say if a child is weighing about 10, not even 10, that's too much, 3 kg. Okay, so if the child is weighing 3 kg, so 3 by one, so they need three mils. So it means that you, you're going to be getting um, three mils per kg, so three mils of this solution. Okay, so if you want to ch change that to uh, milligrams, so let's use a, a dosage of 0 0.01. So that's multiplied by three, that's going to be 0 0.03. So you're going to be using 0 0.03 milligrams. So you will take 0 0.03 milligrams of this. And of course, you're going to be repeating this after every three to uh, five minutes if there is no significant improvement in the heart rate. Then we could also use some volume expansion um, agents. So we should consider this, especially if we have any blood loss or any suspected blood loss. It may be known or it may be suspected. And how do we suspect this? Number one, there's going to be a pale skin. There's going to be poor perfusion. There's going to be a weak pulse. And of course, the baby's heart rate is not going to be responding to the other measures that we have instituted. The chest compressions, the intubation, clearing the airways, putting them in the right position. Um the epinephrine that has been given. It's not going to be responding to this. So you want to give a, an isotonic crystalloid or even blood transfusion at a dosage of 10 mils per kg uh, IV over three to five minutes. Like I said, please avoid boluses. Then you also, when you're resuscitating this premature infants, you should take care to not actually give the fluids very rapidly because these premature infants, their body systems are not yet well developed to tolerate uh, this fluid overload. And then so these rapid infusions of these large volumes is going to be associated with things like intraventricular hemorrhage. Then after now you have resuscitated the child and the child actually has improved and you have been doing these measures and they haven't gone past 10 uh, minutes, you may actually offer some post-resuscitation care to this infant. So the babies who require resuscitation are at high risk of deteriorating. So please make sure that you monitor the vital signs when they return to normal, monitor the ventilation, monitor the circulation, and monitor the other, um, the heart rate, uh, the breathing, um, the heart rate, the breathing rate, even the oxygen saturation. You may also give some drugs, but they're not really recommended. Drugs like naloxone is not really recommended as the initial resuscitative efforts of a newborn with especially those with respiratory depression. And, um, the heart rate and the oxygenation are just simply good enough to increase the heart rate if you have proper ventilation. Then glucose, generally there's no specific target concentration that has been put in literature for glucose, but we may actually give an IV glucose infusion that may be considered as soon as it is practical. And... One also good step that you should actually do is uh, check the blood glucose of this infant because this infant might be hypoglycemic. So if they are hypoglycemic, you start a glucose infusion. And then, of course, you may induce some therapeutic hypothermia in some cases, like I told you, in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So here's the algorithm I was telling you about. So I added two algorithms to this. So the first algorithm here, you get a newborn. You ask yourself those three questions. Is this a term? Is this person breathing? Uh, or oh, are they crying? Is there a good tone? So if they are, then uh, routine care. So you're pretty much going to be providing warmth, put them skin to skin with the mother, clear the airway if it's necessary, if there's any obvious obstruction or any obvious um, 
secretions that are blocking the airway, dry the child, and then of course, continue evaluating them. Now, if one of these questions, the answer is a no, you obviously wanna warm the child, clear the airway if it's necessary and stimulate them. If their heart rate improves, okay, then, um, or if their heart rate is below um, 100, then you wanna continue with a positive pressure ventilation and you monitor the oxygen saturation. If their heart, heart rate improves, meaning it's not below 100, and you ask yourself, is there any labored breathing or persistent cyanosis? If there's any labored breathing or persistent cyanosis, ensure that you check the airway and you clear out the airway, monitor the oxygen saturation uh, of this infant, and consider doing a CPAP, or which is continuous positive airway pressure. Then if not, then this infant is okay, so routine care. Then... If you're still now administering positive pressure ventilation and still you've put the infant in that sniffing air position, you've gotten your face mask, face mask and your ample bag, then um, you're ventilating this child adequately and still the oxygen saturations are less than the optimal that you should get, then and the heart rate is still below 100, then you should take some additional ventilatory corrective steps that we talked about in over the um, um, lecture. So again, if the heart rate is still below 60, then we should consider intubating the child. We should consider starting chest compressions. We should also coordinate these chest compressions with the positive uh, pressure ventilation. And then, of course, if the heart rate is still persistently below 60, we may consider giving um, epinephrine, okay? And then if the heart rate still isn't increasing, then consider other things. Consider that there may be hypovolemia. Consider that there may be a pneumothorax. But of course, if this child improves, then you should, of course, go to a post-resuscitation uh, care. And these are the target um, oxygen saturation percentages that I gave you also in the text. Here's the second algorithm. I really loved this algorithm because we use this locally. Uh, and it's actually very, very practical to do. So the first thing at birth, you're going to be providing warmth, wrap the preterm babies, of course, in a plastic bag, and then you may clear the airways if necessary, dry them and stimulate them. Note the time. This is very important. Take someone to note the time. So when they start, if the child is now uh, crying well and they are breathing well, they have good tone, then routine care. So pretty much maintain warmth, keep the airway clean, ongoing evaluation. Then... After you have now assessed this, if the child is gasping or there is apnea or the heart rate is less than 100 after 30 seconds, then you want to start your ventilation with room air uh, at a rate of about 40 to 60. You connect the pulse oximeter if it's present, give them oxygen as necessary, then ensure that the chest is slightly rising with each breath. Then again, we keep on assessing the breathing, we assess the heart rate, we assess the oxygen saturation, we also assess the color. Now, if the heart rate is less than 60. You start ventilating with room air still. You connect your power saxometer if it's available still. You give oxygen as necessary and you still check that um, the chest is rising. Now, if the chest is not moving, there are certain things that could be, uh, you should think about. Just remember the mnemonic moving. So M for mask seal adequate. So the, the face mask should have a complete seal. O for obstruction, are there any secretions or, pos uh, or the position of the child? So position the child in the right position, suction any secretions. V for ventilation, uh, ventilate more firmly to push in more air. I assess if there's intubation that may be needed. And then N, assess any congenital uh, defects such as a nasocoanal atresia. And then of course G is for any gastric distension, which may actually indicate that you have intubated the esophagus. Then... Continue assessing the breathing and the heart rate. And, and as you can see here, we're assessing every single 30 seconds. Then, of course, this child will still be ventilated on room air, probably at 100%. You would have connected your pulse oximeter. You would have given oxygen. You would have um, also uh, probably intubated at this point. Then, if still the infant's heart rate is less than 60, you start your chest compressions and uh, ventilation at a ratio of 3 to 1. You give your adrenaline about 0 0.1 to, uh, it's actually, this is supposed to be 0. Point, or this is in mils, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 mils. I thought it was in milligrams per kg. So mils per kg, and you diluted 1 to 10,000 uh, parts. Or you could use a 1 mil per kg adrenaline if you're giving via endotracheal tube. And of course, you may repeat this after 3 to 5. Uh, minutes and then of course correct any hypovolemia giving you 10 mils per kg iv over 5 to 10 minutes if this infant doesn't still improve then you should consider that this infant has um 
pneumothorax and consider other causes. Now, of course, here is um, on oxygen administration. So use blended oxygen if it's available to target the preductal saturations. So um, your preductal saturations are here, as I gave you even in the prior diagram. So use these algorithms, pause this video and understand them very well because they are very important, especially when resuscitating a neonate. Now, the final key points before we end this lecture from this is that please do not go over 10 minutes. So after 10 minutes has passed, consider stopping because the uh, adverse effects greatly outweigh the benefits of you doing this. And of course, in infants that have a lower chance or have a very high risk of morbidity and mortality, please contemplate withdrawing or withholding resuscitation. We may consider that that especially if you are in a setup where there is not so much manpower and there are so many children that require resuscitation. So with that said in mind, Thank you for listening to this review lecture video on neonatal resuscitation. I hope it gave you some light on how to resuscitate neonates, especially in the NICU, because this is a very important topic and it may help you save some lives. Thank you for listening to this review lecture. If you haven't yet subscribed, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to be receiving notifications every time I post such videos. Until next time, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Bye-bye.